Hey, this is David Walensky back with another audio interview from the archives of NoDon'tDie.com. This time I'm bringing to you the first half of my conversation with Ed Fries, who was the co-founder of the original Xbox project at Microsoft. We spoke on March 5th, 2015. If you'd like to read a full transcript of this conversation, you can uh, see it in the link below. And uh, also below you'll see a link to my Patreon, which helps uh, support the work that I'm doing well, like this. What would be the metrics I should use to tell? <laughs> no, seriously, like, I guess this, this, usually I ask you to, like, introduce it'll, yourself. It'll be how, how much hate mail you get, <laughs> how, how many comments you get on each article, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not allowing comments on the site, oh, actually, because I'm trying to, like, funnel stuff back out into where all that stuff is. That's probably smart. <laughs> it's a last-minute decision, because yeah. I thought for sure, like... Uh, you know, it's video games, and you're saying something critical, or Troll City, or yeah, days, yeah. I don't want to open myself up to that, but I also would like to funnel that conversation back to where it is and try to. Hmm. So I guess like this is a silly question to so start. Ask with, me some questions. Like, no, no, no. But like seriously, <laughs> like like what, what would the metrics be of telling whether people are less angry? <laughs> That's my games? question. That's my first. That, I'll ask you a couple <laughs> questions. But, like, I hope they get easier than that one. <laughs> I mean, really, is there a way to measure that? I don't know. Are people really angry? I'm not, I don't know. Maybe, I, maybe I'm too insulated from it. <laughs> you think so? Well, who are we talking about who's angry here? Are we talking about gamers? Are we talking about game developers? I wonder, actually, like, if we're just talking here, yeah. although I guess this is part of it. Like, I, I think maybe there are pockets in all areas that are frustrated, but that's inherent in any industry, right? Well, I think the industry's gone through an incredible amount of change over the last 10 years. And, yeah. you know, there's been, on the high end, the sort of relentless consolidation as budgets have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And fewer and fewer teams can do it. And the teams have gotten bigger and bigger. So AAA now is, I mean, it's insane. I mean, if you look at, you go to visit Bungie and there's see 600 people in a, in a giant converted movie theater. Yeah. Spending whatever three hundred million dollars to make a game, um, how do you even do that, right? Mm -hmm. And how many teams in the world can do that? And those guys are some of the very best in the world, mm -hmm. and, and they're still, you know, it's hard, really hard for them. Um, and then there's like this massive gap, <laughs> you know, and everybody who was in the middle uh, is gone. I mean, most yeah. of them are gone. Because yeah. they're, they're either being pushed to the extremes, yeah. you know. And so the publishers can't find enough high-end developers to make games for them because they're all gone. Um, and uh, the developers, I just want to make a $5 million game. I just want to make a $10 million game. <laughs> just. <laughs> just. <laughs> which, which these days is, is, is like know. tiny. But, I know. But, you know, if you could get a publisher convinced to do it, they would push yeah. you up to 50 or, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> or so why does why, why why do those budgets creep? Is it just like strictly wanting to be competitive and more dazzling, or are there actual pressures elsewhere like meriting that? You know, I think it's it, it, like Nintendo has tried, I think, sort of a losing battle to fight against that for two decades of. We'll just keep. Yeah, we'll decades, just, we'll right, just actually, keep our yeah. style simple. Yeah. We'll keep our cost down. We'll show that what really matters is gameplay, which is, of course is true. Yeah. Um, but um, it may be that what really matters for playing is is gameplay, but for selling games, it doesn't seem to be the case. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and and so you know when you got next gen consoles and they want to like, why should I buy an Xbox One if I have a 360? Oh, well, you got to graphics have to be better, right? Yeah. And every time those graphics get better, everything gets way more expensive. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, trying to stay on top of next next gen, whatever next gen is, is driven costs through <laughs> the roof. How much better can the graphics get, though? They can, the which to me is an <laughs> awesome thing. I mean, I mean, it, it, we, we, we finally got, I mean, yeah. we've, we've got 30 years of chasing graphics at yeah. the expense of creativity, yeah. right? At the expense of innovation. And, um, and we're finally to the end of that. We're finally to the absurd end of that, mm -hmm. where 
the budgets are unsupportable. Yeah. The number of teams that can do it is unsupportable. And um, and I'm, you know, I'm like cheering at the bonfire kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I'm like, cause, because what's going to come out of the fire is what's already happening, which is the whole indie movement and, mm -hmm. you know, creativity and uh, gameplay back to being the most important thing, which is, yeah. which is fantastic. You know, so I spend way more of my time these days hanging out with indie developers who are doing, you know, cool things like Don't Starve or, yeah. you know, the, the Spry Fox guys are up the street from me, and mm -hmm. we, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, I just see how people can, well, you know, it's like when I started in the game business, one guy could make a game. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, two or three or four. And, <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, that's sort of the thing though, right? Like, um, like Sierra or id, like those guys were indie before indie was indie, <laughs> right? Like Sierra started on a kitchen table. Absolutely. But we don't really think about them like that. And I don't think we necessarily look to the indie group you're talking about as having the trajectory. I don't know. You know, it's like, when, um, you know, some guy in Sweden makes this ugly block game where you dig in the ground. <laughs> and, Heard of that one. Yeah. You know, yeah. sells it for two and a half billion dollars, buys the most expensive house in Hollywood. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, how much bigger does that have to yeah, get? Yeah, that's certainly, like, that's a huge exception. It's absol absolutely is the exception, but the exception, it's an exception. In every way. But, it, it's an exception but, that drives, you know, thousands of other people to try to do the mm -hmm. same thing. And, yeah. and those exceptions are kind of what entertainment's all about. I mean, yeah. you know, making bets, trying things, and every once in a while something huge succeeds. Mm -hmm. You know, th there's only the appetite for so many fads at once, you know? Yeah. It's like, that, you know, people, people will get sick of that game eventually and then they'll want the new one and the person who's at the right place at the right time, yeah. you know, it'll take Slide off right and, and it'll happen again. So, so then you've talked about like, how developers, I guess, hardware, like how that's changed in the last 10 years. Like how do you feel, has the audience for games changed also in that time? I probably wish I was more connected to the audience. I mean, I connect to gamers through my kids. I have boys who are 10 and 12, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. we play together a lot. Um, and I, I probably insulate them some from the online world. Yeah, and that's what you were saying also. Yeah, because, um, you know, a couple of years ago, because I'll let them play like Halo, you know, I was involved with Halo. <laughs> I say we haven't mentioned yet, yeah. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, one, one night I'm like, I'm going to, you know, when they're in bed, I'm like, I'm going to turn on voice chat because I normally run with voice chat off mm -hmm. and um, just see what it's like, you know, yeah. you know big, big multiplayer combat situation. And I was blown away. I was like, I didn't realize I was so I, I was so yeah. naive about it. You know, I was. I, I about mean, what just specifically? <laughs> I mean, in five minutes, I heard you know every racial slur you could imagine, every yeah. you know over the top insult you could imagine. It was like, okay, turning that off again. Yeah. You know, and I was like, I'm not that easy to shock. It was like, it was like, wow. I mean. You know, I talked to some bungee guys about it. I was like, wow, I didn't know your community was like that. And they're like, yeah, that's the way it is. <laughs> what did they say? <laughs> you know, well, I talked to some other people about it, and they said that yeah. the communities are different. Different games, um, you know, some are much more respectful. Some, that's just sort of the Halo community's thing. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like yeah, okay, that's, that's flag, interesting yeah. that they develop around these different yeah. cultures. Um, I spent a bunch of time with Raph Koster, who's been really involved in trying to understand the, game, the whole Gamergate thing and trying to um, mm -hmm. actually spend, explain it to gamers, game developers, I mean, explain yeah. to game developers what's happening to them and why. And, and he really uh, opened my eyes to the fact that there's, you know, these different cultures and they have different sets of rules. And, mm -hmm. you know, he talked about the, the 4chan culture and what, yeah. what they respect and what they don't respect and how they behave and why when you know, we as a game development community do something that seems reasonable to us actually violates a rule that they have, um, and then they respond in this really aggressive way, and we don't even know why they acted that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just like different culture, different set of rules. Yeah. Um, 
I was talking yesterday to a game developer who's a big League of Legends player, mm -hmm. and uh, and yeah, she was talking about about playing and the abuse she gets and how it's just she's used to it. It's like part of playing the game, and mm -hmm. it's fine, you know. But she 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 talked about a. Uh, another female player in a game yeah. that uh, said she was going to find her at the next League of Legends tournament and beat her up. <laughs> you know, and her response is, okay, I'll be sitting in row, you know, 17, I have bright red hair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> and of course she never showed up. Of course. And, you know, because I mean, it's all this like online yeah, trolling. Yeah, like a, a lot of this stuff. I mean, although... But, but you know, that's, that's kind of like, I don't know, I don't know. Does it have to be that way? Does it have to be our community? I know. I know that the riot has I mean, it's, tried it's to work on their community. Big community, though. I mean, we're talking about like it's like saying like people who read books should all behave slightly <laughs> differently, right? Like I don't like, know how good to people and bad people. Read I don't books. know. If books is a good example. I mean, I'm just saying like it's well, another medium, though, like an entertainment medium. But like, let's take League of Legends. Five sure. people get thrown together and they have to play well to win. Yeah. And if you suck, like I do. You don't want me on your team. Yeah. You know, and you're yeah. probably gonna you're probably gonna make it known. I mean, there are book clubs <laughs> so you can get thrown together with like four other it's probably not gonna happen, but Yeah. Maybe but it, no, but I think it's just the point that like even if there's the perception the medium hasn't changed much, I think the audience is growing, maybe feeling like their needs aren't their needs aren't being met or like it's also too like the fact that like also two white men talking yeah. about this, and these are like insights we may be absolutely lacking. I know. Uh, I made that point too. As if I several times, <laughs> and yet I end up talking to other white men about this as well as well yeah. as people who are not. But like, it's hard to avoid white men in the game business. <laughs> it's true, but you also, I don't know, that's you get more and more uncomfortable the more we go from here. My mom is a. An engineer. Yeah. She grew up as a chemical engineer, mm -hmm. and, I, and uh, I want to do a talk about her. I haven't, I haven't done this yet, but I, I did a talk last year at Dice. About, uh, some partly about my dad. Yeah. And, and so I want to do the, the parallel talk about my mom. Mm -hmm. But she grew up in the '60s as an engineer when there were very few women engineers. And uh, I mean, she had a career in the '60s first. She went to Boeing, and was um, all male. She's a chemical engineer. So all male community. And she was got really frustrated with it. And at one point, she was in charge of putting some document together for the government. And she, out of frustration, she changed every he and him in the document to mm -hmm. her and she, yeah. and submitted it to the government. And the government rejected it and uh, told her to use the neutral term he and him. <laughs> it's not neutral though. <laughs> so anyway, so, <laughs> you know what I mean. I know. It's not, so, that's not the default. That's but. what's funny about it. So, yeah. So she went back. Anyway, <laughs> she ended up after after we were in, in elementary school. She went back to yeah. uh, University of Washington, got a master's in computer science, and again she's in all male world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why I want to get her to talk about it, that whole experience because. Yeah, I mean, NPR had a thing about this recently, uh, women in computer science. It, sh it showed, uh, this is an awesome graph that shows women in all sciences. Um, and it's a line that goes up, you know, percentage of women in that science. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for any science you could think of, whatever, chemical engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, uh, yeah. you know, they, they're all lines that go up from 1960, up, you know, and they're, up, they're not to 50%, but they're approaching. Um, computer science does this. It peaks around 1985, and it goes back down. And so it peaks around 35%, and it drops back down into the teens. Thanks for doing that for the recording. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's it's a, like a bell curve. Just picturing myself transcribing that. Like, it, it, I don't know what I forgot. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, no, it's, no, a, no, it's like a thank bell you. curve. It peaks at 85 yeah. and goes back down. Yeah. And it's like, why? And nobody knows. This NPR article, uh, they, they speculate. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody really knows. And well, do you remember? So, so anyway, she, I'm just, yeah. just, just to finish the no, thought. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. So Didn't she's fascinated on. by this Gamergate thing. I mean, she's almost 80 years old. She, she sent me mail yesterday because she had heard a Brianna Wu interview on, um, mm -hmm. on NPR. And, mm -hmm. she, and she's like, uh, what's going on? She's keep, keep keep me up to date. She wants, to, she wants me to keep her up to date on what's going on. Yeah. Gamergate. <laughs> what do you tell her? <laughs> you know, there's been some good articles. I forwarded some to her about it. There was a, a good article in the New York Times. I think yeah. I covered it a while what ago. What she said? Um, Not to pry, I'm just curious. 
She thinks it's terrible. Yeah, I mean, and, I guess, and, and she, like anything. And she can relate it to things that happened in her own career. I mean, do you remember like a year or two ago, um, well, there's this website called uh, Letters of Note. I don't know about that. And it's just, they, uh, they just post like letters of note that are like historical or interesting okay. or unusual. And just you talking about that reminds me of something I remember seeing like a year or two ago, like a letter from Disney to a woman, I think like in the 40s or the 50s. Uh, I'm sure you already can guess what this letter was, the way you were nodding. It was basically just them rejecting her to be an animator. Oh. And yet, so yeah. I'm curious, like, what changed in that industry where it seemed to bro broaden, like, what people from a company side, like, were capable of, or from an industry side were capable of? Because Disney certainly is, like, a big deal in that industry. So the, this NPR article, as far as, you know, why aren't there more women computer science? They, they have a theory, mm -hmm. and their theory goes like this, that, um, that before 1985, it was hard to have access to a computer before you got to college. Mm -hmm. So people would show up at college, men and women, and they'd pick a, pick a career. You know, maybe it would work out, maybe it wouldn't. But they'd all be at an equal starting place. Um, but, but in the early 80s, the first personal computer started to come out. Certainly, mm -hmm. it was happened to me. I graduated in 1982. We had Apples and I had an Atari 800. By the time I got to college, I had published my first video game. I mean, I could write in basic, Pascal, yeah. you know, C, assembly language. Um, and that's even more true today, you know. I mean, my 12-year-old just did a project in Unity. Um, and, and so the theory is that guys are more likely to do that during those years where mm -hmm. girls are doing other stuff, um, more social stuff. Mm -hmm. And so when they get to college, the guys now, instead of all being equal, the guys are massively ahead of the girls. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, the girls get weeded out very early or have trouble catching up or just get discouraged because they realize, wow, these guys have been doing this for 10 years and I'm doing it now. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's an interesting theory, could be true. Mm -hmm. Um, so usually I ask people to introduce themselves at the beginning of the oh, year, but sorry, I realize, no, 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 it's good. <laughs> okay. It's, 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 uh, uh, I want to just be a I'll conversation. Do, do the but, short version of my, my <laughs> career. You, you, you don't have to do the short version. Like, so I guess just like, I'll, I'll put this up at the top, but like, can you just give um, your full name, like where you're typically based out of, your age yeah. if you want, and um, really I want this to be accessible to people who don't know much about okay. video games, so if you could also share like, what's relevant to know about why you're qualified to talk about the game industry? You bet. So, uh, my name's Ed Fries. It looks like fries, but it's actually <laughs> pronounced Fries. Um, it's true. <laughs> I, am, I am 50 years old. Um, I, uh, I started making games, uh, like I said, when I was in high school, uh, into college. I was working on the side, I was working for a game company in California. The entire video game industry melted down in 1984, um, and we didn't know if it was coming back. Uh, I got a job at a little local company called Microsoft, and I worked on Office software for 10 years. I was one of the first programmers on um, Excel for Windows. There were seven of us did Excel. Um, I w worked on Excel for five years, and I got put in charge of Word. I did Word for five years, and um, but on the side, I'm. Only, I'm playing video games, and, but I'm managing at work bigger and bigger teams. And um, so after 10 years, they were ready for me to run a business. And I said, well, the business I want to run is the video game business, because that's what I'm passionate about. And uh, they told me I was committing career suicide, and why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of the company, to go work on something nobody cares about. Those are direct quotes. Um, but anyway, from vice presidents, uh, but I ignored them. I was going to ask for that, but <laughs> even better, yeah. And, um, and uh, <laughs> so I took over the little little game business, and, yeah. and uh, we had Flight Simulator and not too much else, and we just started putting out bigger and bigger games. We had teamed mm -hmm. up with a company called Ensemble to make Age of Empires, mm -hmm. um, so that came out a few years later, and we just started to do acquisitions and grow and grow the PC gaming business, and did that. And then uh, I'm trying to make this short. No, you don't um, have to. You really don't have to. Then, uh, anyway, then some crazy guys came into my office from the DirectX team and had this idea to make this DirectX box or shortened to just Xbox. And that. People um, that didn't know that. 
Oh, yeah. I, a I, lot I, of people. A lot of people don't know it, so no, I say. I, 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 I say. So I say that. All these. I'm that's the thing I've learned from you so far. Um, <laughs> it's just like, oh, obviously, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so that was the start of the Xbox. Um, I was in charge of making all the games that came from Microsoft for Xbox, the first party team, as you call it. And, yeah. And um, so, acquired uh, Bungie, did, did Halo, um, brought. Peter Molyneux acquired Rare, a lot of other uh, projects, yeah. and uh, just did that through 2004. Uh, left 2000 in 2004, uh, and ever since then, I just I work as an advisor board member to people yeah. in the video game space. So, what are those VPs, it's, uh, it's always hard for me to. I never have a, a job title, so I, that. I, I made I just made a face on my badge. <laughs> Another thing you can't see on the recording, but. People are always like, what should we put? I'm like, so, it's like, yeah. Nah, it's a, it's a <laughs> um, so what do those VPs say now? <laughs> you, you know, the irony was, <laughs> the irony was, uh, probably the most frustrating part of working yeah. on Office was that it was so central to the company mm -hmm. that everyone had an opinion about yeah. what you should do. And we would be in fights with Bill Gates about, yeah. in, you know, what, what should, where it should be and a lot of times we didn't agree, you know, and so when I went to work on games, it was like a breath of fresh air because there weren't a, ho a whole bunch of people above me trying to tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so it was like I just got to go out to this like green field and just do what I thought was right and either it would work or it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, and it mm -hmm. worked pretty well. The reason I left was Xbox got really big and all of a sudden it was like being on office again. There was all I this pressure I'm, to be I'm like, to say, yeah. and you, even if you watch now, like Phil Spencer's speech yesterday, and Phil's a great guy, he's doing a really difficult job. I mean, it's like, okay, now it's, you know, one Windows is gonna run across everything, across Xbox, across, mm -hmm. you know, across your phone, across I'm just like, I would not work in that environment. That's too, I just know it's incredibly political and incredible, you know, mm -hmm. a, a credible set of strategic decisions rather than, yeah. I just want to make cool games, right? Yeah. And, a, and a great game machine. Do you think... Uh, I don't care about what the Windows the, team's goals or the phone team's how do you goals. Think, how do you think that, that those politics affects the game's part, vertical? You know, what's good is that Phil sort of flipped it in a sense and, and mm -hmm. said that games are important on every platform. You know, he, he, and it's... That's true, because you probably assumed and that it, I meant just Xbox. Yeah, which I did. <laughs> well, which means yes, that is smart to flip it. Yeah, so you know, in his talk yesterday, it was like, you know, what's the highest monetizing thing on anything? You know, like on a PC, people spend more money playing games on on Windows Phone or any phone, iOS. Mo most money is raised on games, so mm -hmm. games are super important no matter what the platform is. Yeah. So we have to take them seriously. That's a great crusade. I'm glad he's doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you feel like? Um, are they more creative, less creative? Well, even, I guess I don't know. It's such an odd thing to even say. I, like, here's the deal, right? Yeah. There's fewer and fewer of these teams and projects. They're bigger and bigger, and they're because the budgets are so big. They they basically can't fail, you know. Mm -hmm. Something like Destiny, whatever, five hundred million dollars for development and, and marketing combined. Yeah. I mean. Is you're betting the whole company on this one, this one game, so they can't fail. So yeah. I think that some of the very best talent in the entire industry works on those teams that are left. Incredibly creative people, incredibly talented people. They just live in an environment where they can only do so much. I mean, because the game can't fail. It's not like an indie developer who's trying something new that's never been done and probably won't work. But yeah. maybe it will, and he'll find some whole new path. I mean, but they face similar risks too, right? Like those smaller teams, like they also maybe not as many commas in the budget, <laughs> but no, they also bank on it in a similar way. There are similar risks in that uh, often they're betting their uh, their own money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they're living on top ramen or whatever. Yeah. And if it fails, they're going to go get a job. I mean, yeah. I mean that's the the good news in the game business is nobody like ends up on the street because they're super talented artists or programmers or mm -hmm. both, they can always go get a job. Yeah, um, They can find a job. Maybe it's not even in the game business, but they can find a high paying programmer. Every programmer can have a job yeah. today. Yeah. Um, so so the downside isn't, it's not like quite the same as Activision going out of business or something. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I think, I think among Indies, it's like, they don't want to 
sell out and get a real job if yeah. they could be making games. I agree. 